section eighteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter eighteen in a conversation regarding the fabulous bird called anal in hindi and huma in persian poetry some one remarked that arrows winged with the bird's feathers would reach a prodigious distance the guru remarked that as it was the peculiarity of the bird's feathers to carry arrows to its home in the sky so the repetition of one of the guru's hymns would take the soul to heaven he continued the guru who speaketh truth who serveth the congregation of saints and who hath confidence in the guru's hymns is my sikh and shall for ever abide in bliss several sikhs from the north of the punjab came to visit the guru and present their offerings a sikh residing in rotas in the present district of jalam thought that the most suitable offering he could make the guru was his daughter sahib devi he accordingly took her to him in a palki the guru in response to this offer said he had relinquished family life the girl's father on hearing this became much disappointed and distressed he pointed out that he had long since dedicated her to the guru that in consequence every one called her mother and now no one would wed her after her rejection on the other hand if she remained single great sin would in the estimation of pious persons attach to her parents he accordingly pressed the guru to reconsider his decision the guru then told him to ask her if she would consent to serve him she replied in the affirmative the guru upon this baptized her gave her the name sahib kaur and consigned her to his mother's apartments there she made a vow that she would not touch food until she had seen the guru the guru could not allow her to die of hunger and accordingly visited her one day as she was shampooing him he asked her if she had any request to make she replied that as her two co-wives had sons so she also desired a son to call her own the guru replied i will give thee a son who will abide for ever i will put the whole khalsa into thy lap the lady on hearing this was much pleased and prostrated herself before her master it is still not an uncommon thing for a sikh to say when asked regarding his parentage that his father is guru gobind singh and his mother sahib kaur such a sikh would also say that he was born in patna and resided in anandpur indeed sikhs are enjoined to give these answers at the time of baptism one jaga singh performed most deciduous service for the guru and was consequently much envied by his fellow-servants some said that several men had done similar service and gone away ungrateful and jaga singh was not superior to any of his predecessors others again said that he being a new servant was no doubt diligent but his zeal would soon evaporate the guru overhearing these remarks sent for a vessel of water a stone and some sweets he put the stone and sweets into the water after a short time he ordered them to be taken out the stone of course came out whole but the sweets had all dissolved the guru read his servants a moral lesson from what they had seen he said that those who served him well and heartily blended with him as the sweets had done with the water while those who served him for show and appearance had hearts like the stone which never dissolved he then ordered that no one should for the future molest or speak evil of his faithful servant jaga singh raja ajmer chand though outwardly professing peace determined to again expel the guru from anandpur 
he accordingly sent a brahman as an ambassador but really as a spy on the guru's proceedings the brahman on being introduced to the guru used very mild and plausible language the guru however soon discovered that he was a very dangerous person in no way to be trusted soft to the touch like a snake but filled with concealed poison the man duly set himself to the task of ferreting out the guru's secrets the guru well understood his designs but at the same time maintained a semblance of friendship towards him the brahman wrote to his master to describe the excellent and confidential relations that subsisted between him and the guru and at the same time suggested that some dexterous person should be sent to steal the guru's horses the brahman also kept his eye on the guru's treasury with the object of ascertaining how much it contained and how its contents could be abstracted in due time raja ajmer chand dispatched some of the most expert thieves he could find in his state and they succeeded in depriving the guru of two of his favourite chargers the brahman suggested to the guru to go to the approaching fair of rawalsar near mandi the other chiefs would attend and it would be a good opportunity of cementing friendly relations with them at the same time he told the guru's sikhs as an inducement that if they went there they should see stones swim the guru's mother his wives and his sons all pressed him to visit the fair he yielded to the wish of the majority and ordered all preparation to be made for his departure the brahman informed all the hill chiefs of the guru's intention to appear at the fair and suggested that they should be present also the guru prepared a magnificent reception for them and they were all charmed with his engaging manners the rajas entreated him to forget and forgive their former offences they were assured in reply that the guru would treat them as they deserved at his hands the guru received the wives of the rajas in a separate tent he gave them instruction suitable to their status and position and they were entranced with the interview the guru noticing their admiration told the eldest among them that it was time for their departure the ranis were it is said loath to move but the eldest lady convinced them of the propriety of terminating their visit one of them padmani daughter of the raja of chamba with her father's permission sent the guru a letter in the form of a riddle what is that which is complete what is its three-fourths what is duality what is departure what are the two houses for human beings they ate some and took the rest to sleep with them o oh, guru riddle me this the guru replied a god's body is complete a man's is only three-quarters thereof people run after wealth men and women are but dust people wander in both worlds after eating and spending their wealth in this when the world is destroyed every one goeth to sleep this is the answer to thy riddle o child the princess was much pleased on receiving this answer and with her father's permission went again to visit the guru when she made her obeisance before him he patted her on the shoulder with his bow she said i am thy worshipper why hast thou not patted me with thy hand the guru replied he never touched any woman except his own wives with his hand as the guru was returning home from the fair he was met by the raja of mandi who besought him to pay a visit to his capital the guru readily accepted the invitation during his stay the guru promised the raja that mandi should for ever remain in his line while the guru was occupied with the hill chiefs the brahmans were counteracting his religious efforts sikhs who before their conversion had been brahmans and khatris now came in fewer numbers to visit him they did not wish that their sacrificial threads should be thrown away among the bushes or that they should have to part with their loin-clothes it was in vain the guru 
told them that sikhs should spring from every bush on which their sacrificial threads had been thrown he said that they who had no faith in him might or might not come as they chose the paltry fellows who wore threads the guru thought of no use to him his sikhs should become very powerful if they freed themselves from brahmanical prejudices and influences and adopted the sikh ritual when there were births marriages or deaths in their families the guru upon this prepared a general feast both for sikhs and brahmans but the latter refused to attend and reproached him with having taken away the distinguishing marks of the hindus when the sikhs were feasting he said that as the brahmans had forsaken him so he would forsake them and break off all relations with them to some of his own people who manifested symptoms of dissatisfaction he said that if they remained on good terms with the khalsa they should always be happy otherwise sorrow should be their portion he had given everything to the khalsa spiritual and temporal power enterprise glory self-devotion skill in arms and by these should they acquire empire his speech was heard by his first wife and when he went to his private apartments she inquired what he had left his family he replied that he had given to her children the stable empire of heaven his sikhs were one day discussing idolatry the guru when asked to give his opinion said all worship is valueless without love the worship of images is unreal the worship of god alone is real nothing can be obtained by image worship they who place images before them and worship them are fools let my sikhs ever meditate on the immortal god and worship none besides let them ever practise arms that they may be enabled to defend themselves against their enemies on another occasion the guru gave the following reply to questions put him by his sikhs he who ever thinketh of the future is accepted as the guru's disciple famine is bad and bad is cold bad is the love of a courtesan bad are debt and falsehood utter the truth my friends the guru further advised his sikhs not to employ an enemy as a doctor not to listen to astrologers to avoid greed and to consider wealth unreal as a dream winding up his discourse he said let my sikhs eschew evil adopt what is good and have confidence in me Beshambar of ujjain had once fallen under the influence of the guru's teaching and made him an offering of one hundred rupees he now sent his son a vaishnav called har gopal with an offering of five times that amount the son on seeing the guru eat meat became disgusted the guru said in his presence that all relishes were pleasing to the mind a sikh replied that a relish was only pleasing to the tongue others also gave their opinions and when it came to har gopal's turn he said that the real relish was faith in sikhism the guru knowing that he was not uttering his real sentiments said thou enjoyest no such relish for thou hast no faith in the sikh religion when the guru addressed him further reproaches he fell at his feet and implored his pardon he then laid his father's present of five hundred rupees before the guru the guru in return gave him a steel bracelet to wear and promised that the love of god should abide in his family har gopal not at all satisfied or convinced by the guru's teaching or example took his departure on his way home he stopped at chamkaur where he met an earnest sikh named dayan singh he confided to him how he had wasted five hundred rupees in making a present to a guru who ate meat dayan singh said he would restore him the money if he in return gave him the steel bracelet and the love of god bestowed on him by the guru har gopal was delighted on receiving such an offer and took the money in exchange for what he believed to be the worthless gifts of the guru he traded with the money and made a large profit when he reached home he told his father bishambar all the events of the journey 
beshambar was much distressed at his want of faith in the guru and remonstrated with him har gopal continued his pecuniary speculations and in the end lost all his money he was then satisfied that this was the result of his want of faith in the guru and he prayed his father to take him again to the spiritual and temporal head of the sikhs the father was pleased to do so and set out with his wife and all his family on the way the party called on dhyan singh at chamkaur and induced him to accompany them on their journey bishambar on reaching the guru begged forgiveness for his unworthy son the guru baptized them all and thus addressed har gopal thou oughtest to have had confidence in my words he who believeth that the ten gurus are all the same is a sikh of mine look on the hymns of the granth as the embodiment of the true guru put faith in the guru and becoming a sikh perform thy worldly duties with humble words induct others into the faith and give thy daughter to a sikh let him who is a sikh according to the old rites marry his daughter to him who is a sikh according to the new rites if a sikh cannot find a husband according to the new rites for his daughter then let him give her to him who is a sikh according to the old rites but willing to receive sikh baptism let a sikh receive instruction from another sikh and not consider whether he is of high or low degree look on him as a good sikh who thinketh not of caste or lineage let a sikh be honest in his dealings and pray for him who affordeth him maintenance whoever of the rank of sikh committeth treachery shall find no place of rest love the name repeat it in thine innermost heart teach the name in the name is happiness the name is a generous companion he who liveth for his religion who eateth only to support his body who walketh in the guru's way and who is not enamoured of the world is my friend as when a traveller goeth to a foreign land and is ever hoping for the end of his journey so should man hope for his soul's final repose by doing good works and remaining estranged from the world listen to me my friend and be ever ready to leave this life thou and i shall depart this is not a new ordinance after this the father and son proceeded rejoicing to their home in the course of a short time their wealth increased and har gopal recovered all that he had lost dhyan singh told the guru that as he was ploughing in his field on the day after he had received the bracelet and god's love from har gopal his plough exposed a buried treasure of great value the guru congratulated him and called him a devout sikh who would always possess god's love and favour one day mata jito the guru's wife appeared before him and said thou bestowest on thy sikhs deliverance union with god and worldly blessings let me also be a partaker of thy gifts the guru told her to continually repeat waguru with fixed attention and she should obtain what her heart desired after some time she acquired by her devotion a knowledge of the future and went to the guru in great tribulation she said mercifully save thy children for i foresee thou art going to make them martyrs to thy cause the guru replied is it to reverse god's decree thou didst receive instruction from me i intended that thou shouldst abandon worldly love but it hath increased all the more i have already granted thy sons high rank in god's court wherefore anticipate not their fate jito understanding that the guru did not intend to save the lives of his children said she was going to abandon her body for she could not bear to behold their death the guru replied it is well thou mayest go thy children shall follow thee death is the law of all bodies some may perish four days before and some four days after but all must sooner or later pay the debt they owe upon this it is said jito permanently suspended her breath and her soul took flight to heaven
one day the conversation turned on an expression used by guru har rai that the vessel which baba nanak had constructed for the salvation of the world had almost foundered guru gobind singh vowed that he would repair it for the deliverance of his sikhs on that occasion he gave the following instruction to his assembled sikhs i have established the khalsa for the advancement of true religion let not my sikhs live on religious offerings he who bound by greed obeyeth me not in this shall be born again as a hog religious offerings have the same dissolving effect on men's minds as borax on gold he then quoted the following lines from gur das as it is the custom of hindus to abstain from the flesh of kine as swine and interest are solemnly forbidden the mohammedans as it is sinful for a father-in-law to drink even water in his son-in-law's house as even a sweeper though hungry will not eat hare's flesh as a fly gaineth no advantage but dieth in the clasp of honey so is greed for sacred offerings which are like poison coated with sugar let those who are baptized according to my rights bear arms and live according to their means let them remain true to their sovereign in the battlefield and not turn their backs to the foe let them face and repel their enemies and they shall obtain both glory in this world and the hero's heaven in the next he who fleeth from the battlefield shall be dishonoured in this world and when he dieth shall be punished for his cowardice and nowhere shall he obtain a state of happiness let the members of the khalsa associate with one another and love one another irrespective of tribe or caste let them hearken to the guru's instruction and let their minds be thoroughly imbued with it it is said that as the guru was one day hunting he came on a field of tobacco he reined in his horse and gave expression to his hatred of the plant he maintained that it burned the chest induced nervousness palpitation bronchitis and other diseases and finally caused death he therefore counselled his sikhs to abstain from the destructive drug and thus concluded his discourse wine is bad bang destroyeth one generation but tobacco destroyeth all generations the custom of sale and barter of horses and other animals at religious fairs prevailed even in the time of the guru he went to a fair held in kirkitar on the occasion of a solar eclipse in order to purchase horses to replace those which had been stolen or killed in the previous warfare among other admirers madame nath a superior of yogis waited on him on seeing the guru he remarked that he had the external appearance of a lion but that he was inwardly a saint the guru explained that his external appearance had been assumed with the object of inspiring terror into the turks who had inflicted great misery and hardship on his country End of chapter eighteen section nineteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter nineteen two mohammedan generals syed beg and alif khan were on their way from lahore to dilly they were each in command of five thousand men raja ajmer chand having heard of them thought he would try to secure their assistance to attack the guru the generals on receiving a promise of one thousand rupees a day promised ajmer chand their assistance syed beg however on subsequently hearing favourable accounts of the guru and his sikhs changed his determination and withdrew from the mohammedan army the battle which ensued began with great fury between the gurus and alif khan's troops at a critical moment syed beg approached the sikhs and said that as they believed in the guru so did he 
and he would therefore fight on their side alif khan on seeing that syad beg had joined the sikhs concluded that he had no chance of victory and retired from the contest he was hotly pursued by the sikhs and syad beg on the return of the latter from the pursuit he alighted from his horse and went to offer his obeisance to the guru having broken with the emperor whose servant he had been he threw in his lot with the sikhs gave them all his wealth to assist them in their struggles with the mohammedans and remained with the guru as a trusty and powerful ally a brahman appeared one day in the guru's court and with a loud voice invoked his assistance against some pathans who had forcibly abducted his bride at basi near hashiarpur the guru directed his son ajit singh to go with one hundred horse fall suddenly on the parthans at night and restore the brahman his bride the expedition was carefully planned and courageously executed in the early morning ajit singh produced before the guru the brahman's bride and the offending pathans the latter received condign punishment raja ajmer chand again summoned his allies with the object of chastising the guru there came to him raja bup chand raja wazir singh and raja dev saran raja ajmer chand made a speech in which he warned his brother chiefs of the fate in store for them from the guru and advised them to join him in another expedition to crush him they all expressed themselves in favour of immediate measures and addressed the guru a joint letter to the effect that they had lived peaceably for some time but found he would not cease his aggression and they were therefore obliged to declare war against him the guru briefly replied my sikhs have only come into collision with those who wantonly annoyed them the khalsa are ever awaiting battle to fight and die is the duty of the brave come and see the power of the khalsa the hill chiefs on receiving this reply took the field without delay it is said that they marched against anandpur with ten thousand men syed beg had not been able to induce his large force to remain with him so the guru's available force at this time did not exceed eight hundred men in the former battles of anandpur the sikhs appear to have remained behind their battlements and embrasures on this occasion different tactics were adopted they met the enemy in the open field outside anandpur the sikhs fought with their usual courage and determination raja ajmer chand on witnessing their prowess and the carnage they caused retired from the battle in despair the other hill chiefs continued the fight but put themselves in the rear of their troops alim singh and ude singh displayed their usual valour on behalf of the guru they wished to charge the hill hosts but the guru restrained them and ordered them to use their muskets and arrows from where they stood they obeyed the guru and plied their offensive weapons with signal success the hill troops on seeing their own van stricken down retreated the guru surveyed the battle from a distance he was delighted as he saw the enemy fleeing in every direction the sikhs now flushed with victory forgot his orders and pursued the retreating hill troops the guru was displeased at the temerity of his men and mounting his horse rode back to anandpur the sikh force on finding the guru had left them lost heart retreated and were in turn pursued by the enemy on their return to anandpur they tried to obtain the guru's forgiveness but he refused to speak to them 
at last yielding to the entreaties of narang singh one of his foremost warriors he resolved to receive and pardon them he said the guru was the khalsa and the khalsa the guru and the old friendly and affectionate relations were renewed he then ordered his troops to return to the field and oppose the enemy he took up his own bow and effected the usual destruction in the hostile ranks this was the signal for the sikhs to second his efforts and fall on the hill army like tigers on deer then ensued fearful carnage upon which the hill troops again took flight their leaders tried to restrain them but in vain the battle was at an end and both sides departed to their homes raja ajmer chand however was not satisfied he proposed to his brother chiefs that they should again make war on the guru this time with the assistance of the imperial troops they accordingly sent an envoy to aurangzeb and prayed him to protect them against guru gobind singh they represented that they were ancient subjects of his majesty and would give him large tribute as the price of his assistance and protection meantime there were great rejoicings in the guru's camp and the wounded were carefully attended to bir singh madan singh a rajput chief and sham singh visited the guru sham singh pointed out to him that the muhammadans and hindus were very numerous and how could the sikhs who were so few contend against them much less hope to obtain empire the guru replied what god willeth shall take place when the army of the turks cometh my sikhs shall strike steel on steel the khalsa shall then awake and know the play of battle amid the clash of arms the khalsa shall be partners in present and future bliss tranquillity meditation virtue and divine knowledge then shall the english come and joined by the khalsa rule as well in the east as in the west the holy baba nanak shall bestow all wealth on them the english shall possess great power and by force of arms take possession of many principalities the combined armies of the english and sikhs shall be very powerful as long as they rule with united councils the empire of the english shall vastly increase and they shall in every way attain prosperity wherever they take their armies they shall conquer and bestow thrones on those who assist them then in every house shall be wealth in every house happiness in every house rejoicing in every house religion in every house learning and in every house a woman the english shall rule for a long time at the conclusion of the guru's apocalypse the sikhs respectfully bowed the guru was asked to describe the state of the baptized sikhs whereupon he gave alim singh as an example he was the guru said originally a brahmin but on adopting the religion of arms he now shineth like indar he ever worshippeth the sword he never accepteth gifts or invitations to feasts i took away his sacrificial thread because if he retained it he would still be a brahmin and subject to brahmanical superstitions the guru continued to instruct his sikhs he who weareth long hair without receiving baptism is a hypocritical and foolish sikh i will not show myself to him it is best to adopt one religion and not distract one's mind with others 
they who call themselves my sikhs and stray to other creeds are sinners let no sikh associate with much less offer presents to those who worship sarwar guga and similar peers or with the misguided men who by order of their wives visit male and female brahmans to have their fortunes told he who giveth alms to brahmans who slandereth the guru and his sikhs shall lay up for himself suffering put away from among you the hypocritical brahman who though he received my baptism removeth his hair in the fashion of the hindus let not any sikh of mine worship hindu or mohammedan cemeteries in places of cremation or give alms to one who weareth a religious garb or for ostentation i have forsworn such a person if any there be and let him who stupidly worshippeth false gods forswear me he who feedeth the traveller who giveth alms on the occasion of the guru's anniversaries and who hath faith in the guru shall hereafter go to the guru's abode let not my sikhs look at brahmans who reside at places of pilgrimage or at those who don religious garbs and strut foppishly let my sikhs abide apart and be ever full of thoughts of god he who giveth his daughter in marriage to a sikh and taketh no money for her is a sikh of mine and shall after his death reach mine abode let sikh men and women sit together and hold divine discourse let them worship god themselves and teach their children to do so my sikhs may receive a voluntary offering for reading the granth or for copying it but must not demand remuneration let the sikh priest who receiveth an offering of money feed the poor before he feedeth himself let not my sikhs be covetous they who disobey this order shall receive punishment from god i love neither religious garbs nor castes men's observance of the sikh tenets is dear to me but still dearer is their observance with sincerity let my sikh love not the world but pass his time as if he were to die to-day or to-morrow let him be ever true to his sovereign let him cherish his neighbour and seek after righteousness let him eat and worship at fixed times let him shake off sloth and sing the guru's hymns hear me o sikhs practise not selfishness assist men whether of high or low degree but contract not friendship with the evil false is he who maketh promises without intention of fulfilment let him who calleth himself a true sikh of mine accept baptism and do good acts so shall his previous sins all depart on his seeking the guru's protection let him renounce the service of demons and sprites and not worship stones or false gods the hypocrites who stop their noses under pretence of meditation and count their beads are very impure why do the fools into whose hearts god's love entereth not wander to places of pilgrimage on another occasion his sikhs requested the guru to give them further instruction that would aid them in their temporal affairs and ensure their deliverance from transmigration at that moment the guru was engaged in other affairs and he delegated daya singh to deliver the necessary instruction daya singh thus spoke act as follows and you shall be happy clothe and feed the sikhs as far as your means allow shampoo them and bathe them wash their clothes fan them when they perspire wipe their shoes wash their feet scour the dishes from which they have eaten draw them cool water from the well and cook their food with the utmost attention and cleanliness
let them perform night and day these and other similar offices for the sikhs commit to memory the guru's hymns and repeat the true name on seeing any person involved in trouble take compassion on him and remove his sufferings to the best of your ability the exercise of mercy and compassion is very meritorious he who practiseth these virtues becometh the greatest of the great and the primal supreme being will be merciful unto him speak the truth this bringeth great comfort renounce falsehood which bringeth great misery in its train on seeing another's happiness be not envious thereof why attach sin to yourselves for no sufficient reason in the first place your jealousy will cause you annoyance and you shall gain nothing therefrom and in the second place god will be angry with you and say it is i who gave and yet this man is burning with envy there are also other evils attendant on this passion abandon covetousness practise contentment covet not another's wife another's wealth or another's children if you do you shall assuredly suffer my friends practise not oppression on those whom you know to be weaker than yourselves be not proud of the possession of learning beauty great intellect untold wealth or similar fleeting advantages above all deem the bountiful creator one alone if he who doeth good acts practise pride they shall be as futile as the bathing of an elephant indulge not in praise of yourselves or dispraise of others if you do it will be a great sin if ever you make a gift boast not of it but rather strive to conceal it speak civilly and satisfy everybody use not harsh language and annoy no one obtain wealth by honest means and share your meals with strangers wear not dirty clothes so shall your bodies be ever clean associate not with thieves adulterers highway robbers gamblers ingrates thugs deceivers or men of bad livelihood remember the sinner is worse than the sin for he is the cause thereof when you see an evil man avoid him at once like red-hot iron which cannot be held in the hand associate with the good for in such association vice is put to shame listen to the history of the lives of the gurus afterwards where there is discourse of god listen to it with rapt attention bathe in holy amritsar behold god's temple where the guru's words are ever repeated sit down therein respectfully and allow your minds to think of nothing but god ever look with devotion on where his light is resplendent whether you go there on the occasion of the guru's anniversaries or visit the place every six months or once a year if you live at a distance if he who deemeth himself a sikh behold not amritsar why did he take birth in the world unprofitable was his advent and he shall afterwards regret his negligence the guru kept fifty-two bards permanently in his employ and others occasionally visited him they wrote on all the nine subjects which in the opinion of orientals are suitable themes for poetry but the composition of eulogies on the guru occupied most of their attention the guru once had the curiosity to weigh their compositions they amounted to about two and a half hundred weight the guru included them in a compilation which he called vidyadhar he so valued the book that he ever kept it by him even when he went into battle but it was lost in one of his engagements some of the bard's compositions are preserved in the suraj parkash where they may be perused by the curious end of chapter nineteen
section twenty of sikh religion volume five by max arthur macauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty owing to the repeated representations of the hill chiefs the emperor sent a large army under syed khan to reduce the guru to submission the guru received intelligence that the imperial army had arrived in thanissar and would soon reach anandpur on hearing this he mustered his troops and found they were only five hundred strong the rest of his army had dispersed to their homes nothing now remained for the guru but to make the best defence he could with his present force in a few days syed khan's troops appeared in sight singing a war hymn to stimulate their spirits maiman khan a faithful mussulman who had attached himself to the guru said that he was indebted to him for many favours and asked permission to show his prowess the guru gave him a bow and told him he would do well to kill even his own co-religionists on account of their misdeeds the brave and faithful syed beg also came forward to continue his services to the guru both mussulmans went like tigers into the battle and were followed by the sikhs the latter represented to the guru that it was futile to contend with such a large army as had now appeared the guru in reply encouraged them and they advanced boldly against the enemy the early part of the battle was signalized by a fierce single-handed combat between a hill chief and syed beg after they had repeatedly missed each other syed beg at last struck off the hill chief's head on seeing this din beg of the imperial army rushed at syed beg for whom he cherished a double hatred as the slayer of the hill chief and as a deserter from his sovereign and mortally wounded him syed beg died praising the guru then ensued a general engagement of both armies the sikhs performed prodigies of valour and the mussulmans are said to have fallen to the earth like minarets toppling from their heights maiman khan charged on horseback in every direction and committed great havoc among the imperial troops an unexpected circumstance now occurred syed khan the general of the imperial troops had long been a secret friend of the guru and when he heard that an expedition was to be sent against him contrived to be put in command of it so that he might at last be able to behold the great priest of the sikhs and do him signal service the guru knew what was passing in syed khan's mind and advanced ostensibly to challenge him saying if thou attack me not i will not attack thee syed khan on obtaining the wish of his heart to behold the guru said that he was the guru's servant and slave and that he would never fight against him the guru replied i am a poor man it is only rich men who have slaves to conquer in war is ever held honourable syed khan dismounted and fell at the guru's feet the guru conferred on him the true name and the supreme reward of salvation syed khan however did not actively assist the sikhs but turned aside from the battle as he was unable to restrain his troops or divert their energies to the guru's assistance they made a fierce onslaught on the guru's soldiers who began to retire overpowered as they were by a multitudinous host but at a critical moment the sikh war cry was raised upon which the sikhs rallied and presented a bold front to the enemy after syed khan's defection from the imperial cause ramzan khan took command and fought with great bravery against the sikhs the guru seeing this let fly an arrow at him which killed his horse the guru on closely observing the combat saw that there was no chance of retrieving his position so he decided to evacuate anandpur the muhammadans then captured the city and plundered the guru's property 
on obtaining this booty they proceeded in the direction of sarhind some sikhs not yet satisfied with warfare asked the guru's permission to pursue them the guru replied that as his sikhs were subservient to him so was he subservient to god he repeated on the occasion the third slok of the asa ki war by this he meant that it was god's will that he should be defeated and as all creation feared god so did he himself at all times the sikhs feeling their defeat again pressed their request the guru at last yielded and allowed them to pursue their enemies the latter were unprepared for attack and fell into great confusion on finding themselves pursued by the very men whom they already thought they had vanquished the turks who turned to oppose the sikhs were killed and only those who took to flight escaped the vengeance of the guru's pursuing army in addition to killing and dispersing the muhammadans the sikhs deprived them of all the booty they had captured at anandpur the remnant of the muhammadan army finally made their way to sarhind on this the guru returned and took possession of anandpur the emperor called on his fugitive troops to account for their cowardice they pleaded that they had been waylaid by the sikhs and taken at an unfair advantage this excuse seems to have been accepted for the emperor then turned their conversation in another direction and asked what sort of person the guru was and what forces he possessed a muhammadan soldier gave highly coloured accounts of the guru's beauty sanctity and prowess he was he said a young handsome man a living saint the father of his people and in war equal to one hundred thousand men the emperor was much displeased on hearing this panegyric of the guru and ordered that the panegyrist should be excommunicated the court quasi advised that the guru should be brought to the emperor's presence by some stratagem accordingly the emperor sent him the following message there is only one emperor thy religion and mine are the same come to see me by all means otherwise i shall be angry and go to thee if thou come thou shalt be treated as holy men are treated by monarchs i have obtained this sovereignty from god be well advised and thwart not my wishes to this the guru replied my brother the sovereign who hath made the emperor hath sent me into the world to do justice he hath commissioned thee also to do justice but thou hast forgotten his mandate and practisest hypocrisy wherefore how can i be on good terms with thee who pursuest the hindus with blind hatred thou recognizest not that the people belong to god and not to the emperor and yet thou seekest to destroy their religion when dispatching this reply to the emperor the guru conferred a robe of honour on his envoy the sikhs of the malwa and manja districts now thronged to the guru in great numbers and began to study the science of war under his tutelage raja ajmer chand was distressed on seeing the power and glory of the sikhs daily increase and prevailed on the other hill chiefs to join him in another mission to the emperor to make further complaints against the guru the emperor was at that time in the south of india and thither the raja proceeded in person to lay the petition of the allied chiefs before him it described the foundation of anandpur by guru teg bahadur whom the emperor had executed and the martial and troublesome proclivities of his son the present guru gobind singh it then proceeded to give the raja's own version of the guru's proceedings and how he had asked them to embrace his new religion and join them in waging war against the emperor aurangzeb fearing that the guru would become too powerful and also displeased at the state of unrest that prevailed in the panjab ordered all available troops under the viceroys of dihli sarhind and lahore to be dispatched against the guru the hill chiefs who complained should also assist in repressing the common enemy 
at the conclusion of the campaign the guru was to be captured and brought before the emperor it would appear from an interview which raja ajmer chand subsequently had with the dihli viceroy that the latter in view of the safety of the capital of the empire was not at the time in a position to dispatch any troops against the sikhs the guru was informed by a faithful sikh of the result of raja ajmer chand's mission to the emperor he harangued his troops on the duty of religious warfare against the muhammadans and on this subject he had much to say from the time of the persecution of guru arjan up to the present the emperors had seen open or covert foes of the gurus and their sikhs the guru affirmed that death on the battlefield was equal to the fruit of many years devotion and ensured honour and glory in the next world the time for the diwali fair was now approaching sikhs came in large numbers to make offerings the guru issued orders to absent sikhs to come with their arms and assist him the guru's orders were generally obeyed and warlike preparations began at anandpur the hill chiefs who arrayed themselves against the guru were ajmer chand of bilaspur guman chand of kangra bir singh of jaspal and the rajas of kulu kianthal mandi jammu nurpur chamba gular sringar bijarwal darali and dadwal they were joined by the rangars and the gujars and all formed a large and formidable host the imperial army however amounted to double their number wazir khan who had been put in supreme command by the emperor mustered his troops at sarhind for parade and inspection some faithful sikhs ever kept the guru informed of the movements of his enemies he read in darbar the last letter of information he had received and vowed to destroy his enemies and put an end to the sovereignty of the mughals the sikhs were delighted at the prospect of battle and congratulated themselves on their good fortune in being allowed to die for their guru and their faith several of them put on saffron coloured clothes in token of rejoicing and said we have only four days to live in this world why should we not endeavour to obtain the exalted dignity of martyrdom which will ensure salvation every variety of warlike weapon was served out to the guru's followers and no one was left unarmed the guru took the precaution of laying in supplies for the maintenance of the garrison in the event of a siege he addressed his troops consider the hill chiefs as well as the muhammadans your enemies fight bravely and they shall all flee away the guru then repeated the following quatrain of his own composition blessed is his life in this world who repeateth god's name with his mouth and meditateth war in his heart the body is fleeting and shall not abide for ever man embarking in the ship of fame shall cross the ocean of the world make this body a house of resignation light thine understanding as a lamp take the broom of divine knowledge into thy hand and sweep away the filth of timidity the chronicler judiciously remarks that the khalsa ought to be congratulated because though few in number they had confidence in themselves to fight for their religion and delighted by anticipation in the approaching conflict End of chapter twenty section twenty one of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty one wazir khan's troops advanced from sarhind like a surging sea drums sounded and banners flew at the head of every regiment in similar formidable array came the troops of zabardas khan the viceroy of lahore the two viceroys joined their forces at ropar there they were met by the troops of the allied hindu rajas and all proceeded against the guru to anandpur 
the guru on seeing the enemy approach in a body ordered his artillerymen to light their fuses and discharge their cannon into the hostile army where thickest when fire was opened the enemy made a charge to seize the artillery but were quickly restrained by the fatal accuracy with which the guru's men served their guns meanwhile the sikh cavalry advanced and discharged their muskets at close quarters they were well supported by the infantry who manned the embrasures the allied army had no protection and consequently fell in heaps before the city the battle continued with terrific violence the sun was obscured by the smoke from the guru's garrison guns heroes were all stained with blood and cries of strike strike kill kill everywhere resounded riders lost control over their horses which fled in every direction and the battlefield presented a truly ghastly spectacle the guru sent for his two brave generals ude singh and daya singh encouraged them and gave them renewed orders the two chiefs courageously advanced with their troops and cut down the enemy as reapers a cornfield dust flew into the eyes of their opponents and rendered them powerless for action they had no power to withstand the forces now ranged on the guru's side and consequently fell in large numbers the two viceroys were astonished at the unwanted destruction of their armies they rallied their men but again the same evil fate attended them at last it was resolved to storm the fortress the muhammadan troops were told that the guru was only a fakir that he had no power to offer long resistance and must soon capitulate the carnage began anew many brave muhammadans were dispatched to wed the soul delighting nymphs of paradise the contest continued with the greatest obstinacy and horse and foot for the space of three hours were mingled in indiscriminate slaughter the mohammedans hazarded different opinions as to the cause of the success of their enemies some said that the guru was a miracle worker and that supernatural forces fought on his side others maintained that the guru's success was owing to the fact that his men were protected behind their ramparts while such conversation was being held the viceroys asked the hill chiefs to show them how they were to obtain victory if the same ill success attended them to the end the sikhs would never allow them to escape the hill chiefs suggested that they should then cease fighting and next day bring cannon to batter down the fort it is true the hill chief said the guru's army is a low rabble but very brave on a muster being taken it was found that nine hundred of the muhammadan troops lay dead on the field of battle after the first day's engagement next day the guru mounted his charger and put himself at the head of his troops the viceroys observed a warrior mounted on a sable steed with a gold embroidered saddle he carried a bow painted green and his crest set with jewels glittered on his turban they inquired of raja ajmer chand who it was and he answered that it was the guru every effort was now made to destroy him but the first fire of the enemy was aimed too high and took no effect the muhammadan gunners were then ordered to fire low and promised large rewards if they killed the guru they were equally unsuccessful when they fired low the allied armies finding their guns useless resolved to charge the guru and his sikhs 
the guru seeing this began to discharge his arrows with marvellous effect the fearful carnage of the preceding day was again renewed horses fell on horses and men on men the hindus and the mohammedans entered on mutual recriminations each sect blaming the other for its ill success upon this they combined and made a further effort to conquer but were so vigorously and successfully repulsed that they were obliged to suspend hostilities for that day also the viceroys and the hill chiefs took counsel at night and resolved on the morrow to encompass the city and cut off all external supplies so that the guru and his troops might be starved into submission while they were thus discussing they apprehended a night attack from the sikhs and accordingly kept vigil next morning a watch before day the guru and his sikhs were found at their devotions when divine service was finished the guru ordered his men to remain behind their embrasures and barricades and not be tempted to advance or come to close quarters with the enemy meantime the mohammedans and hindus contented themselves with watching the city gates and hindering all ingress or egress at the same time they remained at a safe distance from the missiles of the sikhs the allied forces made another assault on anandpur they espied the guru at a distance and again ordered their artillerymen to direct their cannon towards him the sikhs were much disconcerted by the enemy's fire and requested the guru to take up a less exposed position the guru replied that he wore the armour of the immortal god and consequently no weapon could harm him god was his protector and had stretched forth his hand to save him from all assaults of his enemies while the guru was thus speaking cannon-balls from the enemy hurtled in the air they were again aimed high and missed the sikhs when the artillerymen were ordered to lower the muzzles of their guns their fire fell short of the sikhs and struck the base of the eminence on which the city stood the allied armies discharged their cannon hundreds of times but whether they fired high or low their missiles failed to have the desired effect thus the day passed until night terminated the conflict on the morrow skirmishes were renewed on both sides and the sikhs inflicted severe chastisement on the enemy the guru called his son ajit singh and told him to hold that part of the city called gesgar and not venture forth he gave him further orders to kill any one who approached to remain on the alert at night and to keep his guns loaded the guru directed nahar singh and sher singh to hold the fort called logar for this purpose five hundred men were placed at their disposal alim singh with another detachment of five hundred men was ordered to hold the fort of agampur ude singh also received command of five hundred men to defend another part of the city daya singh was ordered to guard the northern ramparts the mohammedans and the hill chiefs had now completely invested the city and the guru's supplies were failing the enemy noticed that the singhs on guard went twice a day from their embrasures to pray and do homage to their guru the guru in turn kept an eye on the proceedings of the allied armies one day he saw the generals playing indian drafts raja ajmer chand and others were watching the game the guru taking up his bow discharged an arrow into their midst but without striking any one they examined the arrow and knew by its golden point that it had been discharged by the guru they admitted that only a miracle could have sent it such a distance 
the guru knew by his occult power what they were saying and wrote them the following letter o oh, viceroy that was not a miracle miracle is a name for the wrath of god i was merely practising archery the brave men who have obtained skill in it conceal not their accomplishments everything is in god's hands whether he desireth to make what is difficult easy or what is easy difficult the guru attached this letter to an arrow and then discharged it it lodged in a branch of a tree under which the allied generals were seated on perusing the guru's letter they were astonished that he could have divined what they were saying and it is said that they admitted his supernatural power and prayed to heaven to preserve them from his two unerring shafts and his unsurpassed knowledge of warfare on one occasion it was observed that the enemy had come very close to the city and far away from their defences sher singh accordingly suggested to nahar singh that it would be expedient to make a night attack and thus take them unawares when they should of necessity become an easy prey if the sikhs waited until morning the enemy would be far away and it would be impossible to reach them the night was dark and favoured the enterprise nahar singh did not at first approve of the suggestion but subsequently altered his mind the sikh troops were awakened at dead of night and arms served out to them having performed their ablutions they sallied forth two hours before daybreak sher singh commanded them to make one charge and then return they did great havoc among the mohammedans killing them in numbers and succeeded in returning to anandpur by daybreak the enemy on being aroused could not see whence destruction had overtaken them and began to turn their arms against one another father attacked son and son attacked father and with mutual reproaches there resulted internecine slaughter the mohammedan generals were greatly distressed on learning what had occurred they blamed ajmer chand for the disaster and asked how he could again show his face to the emperor he had told the emperor that the sikhs were very few and now whence had so many men sprung forth on a sudden the mohammedan generals threatened to leave ajmer chand and his people to the mercy of the sikhs but ajmer chand and Bup chand offered them large presents and thus prevailed on them to renew the conflict next day the allied forces advanced to take the citadel by storm the sikhs on seeing this put their two great guns called bagan tigris and by jai Naj, sound of victory in position the guns were then charged the fuses lighted and aim taken at the enemy where most thickly massed together the tents and standards of the mohammedans were first blown away their two generals on seeing this retreated as the guns committed further destruction both the mohammedan and the hill armies took to flight that evening the guru offered thanksgiving beat the drum of victory and put his cannon into a place of shelter the guru was informed that a man called kanaya used with absolute impartiality to draw water both for his sikhs and the enemy the guru asked him if it was so and he replied in the affirmative he quoted the guru's own instruction that one should look on all men with an equal eye the guru mused on his reply and dismissed him with the compliment that he was a holy man his followers called suwapanthis formed an orthodox and honourable subsect of sikhs who live by honest labour and accept no alms or offerings of any description the suwapanthis are also called adanshahis from adanshah a rich banker 
who devoted his wealth and his leisure to the propagation of their doctrines when provisions were running short the sikhs made several night sorties and took supplies from the enemy's camp on such occasions they were often attacked but they generally contrived to return with scant loss when any one of their party was cut down they took his body and carried it into anandpur in one of these sorties a sikh fainted the muhammadans seized him cut off his hair made him eat their food and repeat their creed and finally circumcised him they then strange to say allowed him to escape probably because they thought they had accomplished a sufficiently pious work in forcibly converting him he informed the guru of what had happened to him and prayed to be received again into the sikh fold the guru inquired if he had cohabited with a muhammadan woman he replied in the negative the guru then ordered him to prepare sacred food and distribute it among the sikhs and his reconversion should be complete the guru explained that a sikh who was forcibly converted to islam was still a sikh but that a sikh who became a muhammadan from motives of sensuality should forfeit his happiness here and hereafter several of the inhabitants now deserted anandpur on account of the difficulty of maintaining themselves provisions became excessively dear a pound of flour selling for a rupee the guru's troops however remained to endure hunger and every form of hardship they had already decided to sacrifice their lives for him and they could not leave him in this extremity complaints were made to his mother by some of the malcontents but she only ventured to speak to him when her own private servants rebelled against their fate she said thy sikhs who were foremost in the fight are now dying of hunger and the enemy are at thy gates each of thy soldiers hath now but a quarter of a pound of corn daily how can men fight on such a pittance their patience is exhausted the guru replied having obtained the order of the immortal god my object is to increase and not diminish the numbers of my religion it is by enduring hunger and hardships my sikhs become strong and brave one day there was an alarm that the hillmen were advancing in force the guru having caused his great drum to be sounded proceeded to the spot whither the assault was directed bullets and arrows poured from both sides and the sikhs being now reduced in numbers had to retreat the turks and hillmen inflicted great damage on them as they did so and took from them a large quantity of booty the sikhs struggled but their efforts were ineffectual against overpowering numbers ude singh and others went to the guru and told him that the sikhs were defeated and their property plundered at this critical moment all his troops prayed to the guru for protection the guru said they ought to feel no pleasure in the possession of wealth which was not permanent and no sorrow at its departure until now the beleaguered garrison had been supplied with water from a hill stream this was discovered by raja ajmer chand and he cut off the supply when the guru was informed of this he said that satluj would for the future supply him with water and the enemy should gain no advantage from the stream they had diverted the guru promised that water should come in time and the name of the stream should be the himaiti nala or stream of assistance End of chapter twenty one section twenty two of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe 
this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty two as the siege was protracted the hardships of the troops and of the other inmates of anandpur painfully increased rations were now reduced to less than a quarter of a pound of corn daily and sometimes none at all were served out the sikhs occasionally made foraging expeditions at night and fought hard for small booty when this was exhausted they ground the bark of trees and converted it into bread they also lived on leaves and whatever fruit and flowers they could collect it is related that with notwithstanding their terrible sufferings they never lost heart or relaxed in the defence of their city the enemy heard of the sikhs forays and appointed several scouts to watch their operations one night as the sikhs sallied forth they were observed and information promptly given to the allied army no action however was taken until the sikhs on their return approached the city they were then attacked by both hindus and mohammedans in great numbers the sikhs threw down their bundles and determined not to die like jackals as long as there is breath in our bodies they said let us wield our swords and place ourselves beyond the fear of transmigration although they were faint with hunger yet each of them killed two or three of the enemy finally overpowered by superior numbers and unable to receive assistance from within the city they all perished fighting to the last the rajas now formed a plan to induce the guru again to leave anandpur they promised that in the event of his doing so their armies would withdraw and the guru might afterwards return whenever he pleased the guru heeded not this proposal it was repeated several times but the guru still refused to accept it the sikhs never heard of these overtures until one day in darbar raja ajmer chand's envoy produced his master's letter raja ajmer chand stated that it contained no deception but it was honestly intended it would he said be well if the guru and his troops evacuated the city as early as possible they might take all their property with them the sikhs who heard this proposal went to the guru's mother to urge it on her and she promised to use her influence with him she said my son this is a propitious offer take us with thee and leave anandpur i am thy mother and i ask thee to obey me and seek shelter elsewhere thus shalt thou restore life to thy starving sikhs my son fighting were perhaps well if we had wherewithal to maintain ourselves but now we are involved in poverty and hardships of every description if thou let the opportunity pass it will not return again the hillmen and the turks are prepared to swear that they will grant us safe conduct so it is well that we should depart moreover khwaja mardad hath now arrived from the emperor with a message that he hath vowed to capture thee or die in the effort all the rajas are on his side wherefore my son let us withdraw from anandpur there is nothing more precious or dearer than life the guru replied mother dear the hillmen are idolaters and false their intellect is like that of the stones they worship there is no reliance to be placed on their promises the turks are equally evil their very falsehood will destroy them all the khalsa shall extend and wreak vengeance on its enemies the guru was unable to convince his mother or his sikhs of the wisdom of the course he was following he then hit on a plan by which they should be convinced that the overtures made to him had been treacherously intended the guru sent for raja ajmer chand's brahman envoy and told him he would evacuate anandpur if the allied armies would first allow the removal of his property he asked for pack bullocks for the purpose these with the necessary sacks were readily supplied him the hindus swore on the salagram and the mohammedans on the koran that they would not deceive him or molest his servants departing with his property 
the guru then ordered his treasurer to collect all the old shoes worn-out clothes bones of dead animals broken utensils horse dung and similar offal that could be found in the anandpur bazaar and load the sacks therewith on each sack was to be placed a piece of brocade to make it appear that the contents were valuable to the bullock's horns were attached torches so that the excellence of the cloth with which the sacks were covered and also the departure of the bullocks might not escape the observation of the enemy it was arranged that the bullocks with their loads were to start in the dead of night naturally the brilliancy of the procession did not escape the enemy's notice and they rejoiced like a parched field on receiving rain six thousand of them were in ambush to plunder the supposed property of the guru the sikhs on discovering this discharged their cannon and caused great destruction among the serried ranks of the hindus and mohammedans the sacks were however all seized by the enemy and carefully guarded until morning as it was then too late to examine their contents it was only on the morrow the enemy discovered the guru's stratagem and painfully realized the fact that they had committed perjury for the sake of the sweepings of the anandpur market-place the guru availed himself of the incident to demonstrate his own forethought and the treachery of the enemy he told his troops that everything they had endured had been by the will of god and he quoted guru nanak happiness is a disease the remedy for which is unhappiness at last came an autograph letter from the emperor to the guru i have sworn on the koran not to harm thee if i do may i not find a place in god's court hereafter cease warfare and come to me if thou desire not to come hither then go whithersoever thou pleasest the emperor's envoy added on his own account o guru all who go to the emperor's court praise thee on that account the emperor feeleth certain that an interview with thee will add to his happiness he has sworn by muhammad and called god to witness that he will not harm thee the hill rajas have also sworn by the cow and called their idols to witness that they will allow thee safe conduct bear not in mind anything that hath occurred the attack on thine oxen was not prompted by any raja the attackers have been generally punished and the ringleaders are in prison no one now o true guru dareth do thee harm wherefore evacuate the fort at any rate for the present and come with me to the emperor thou mayest afterwards do what thou pleasest the guru on hearing this said you are all liars and therefore all your empire and your glory shall depart you all took oaths before this and then perjured yourselves your troops whose business it was to fight have become robbers and therefore you shall all be damned the sikhs went again to the guru's mother to complain of his refusal to listen to reason upon this she told him that if he did not leave anandpur he would be deserted by his sikhs and even by his family and he would be then left alone to the mercy of the hostile armies some sikhs also made a direct representation to him and pleaded that through hunger they were unable to endure any longer the fatigue of the siege and the brunt of war and if they were now in their weak and emaciated condition to make an effort to force their way through the enemy's ranks they would all be inevitably massacred they therefore advised capitulation the guru on hearing these representations said to his sikhs my brethren they who leave the garrison now will all be killed and i do not desire to be held responsible wherefore give me a statement in writing that you have totally renounced me and then you may act as you please but if on the other hand you wish to abide by my advice i will support you and the immortal god will extend his protecting arm over us all adopt whatever alternative you please on hearing this the sikhs and the guru's mother hesitated her son was dear to her but so was her own life she resolved however that she would not separate from him 
the sikhs too felt that having vowed never to leave the guru they could not abandon him or make a formal declaration that he was not their guru and they were not his sikhs when the turks and the rajas heard from the imperial envoy of the failure of his negotiations they decided to send the guru's mother an embassy with a request that she and her grandchildren should abandon the fort this was in the hope that when the guru found himself alone he would follow them the envoy first proceeded to the guru and endeavoured to persuade him to evacuate the guru replied that he could not rely on any promise made by the idolatrous rajas or the hypocritical mohammedans he then expatiated on the villainies and inherent turpitude of aurangzeb a man who had no regard for an oath and whose god was money as was apparent from his persecution of the king of golconda against whom his operations were now directed the envoy seeing there was no hope from the guru then proceeded to the guru's mother and employed all his arguments to convince her that it was expedient for the guru and his sikhs to leave anampur o lady save thyself and all thy family what will it avail thee to remain here and if thou depart what harm will it do thee the guru's sikhs are everywhere ready to receive thee and whithersoever thou decidest to go thou mayest abide in happiness this city will still be thy property but leave it now and end the quarrel hundreds of thousands are waiting to behold thee explain matters to thy son and persuade him to obey thee if not then prepare to go thyself and he will follow thee of his own accord if thou listen not to this advice great sufferings will result the guru's mother promised to use all her efforts to persuade her son and said she would place confidence in the oaths of the turks and the hill rajas the sikhs sore stricken with hunger supported the envoy's representation o true guru knowing us to be thine own grant us the gift of life if thou agree not to this let us retire to some forest where the turks cannot reach us here shut up in this fort many have died and many more will die no food can come to us from outside and we have now been fighting for a long time o great king how can we who are famished with hunger continue to do battle accept our advice oblige us not to renounce thee and expel us not from thy faith if thou adhere to thine own resolve we must part company for life is dear to every one and what will a dying man not do nay we pray thee to assist thy sect and save our lives the guru replied my brethren waver not i only desire your welfare you know not that these people are deceivers and design to do us evil if you hold out a little longer as you have done you shall have food to your heart's content i ask you to wait only three weeks when the sikhs refused to wait so long the guru asked them to wait at least for five days and the great god would send them succour the sikhs refused to wait even a single day and said it was impossible for them to do so in their dire distress the guru repeated his request and said that the enemy would then retire and they should all be happy if his sikhs were to leave now they would inevitably be killed as a child continued the guru on seeing fire trieth to grasp it while his parents restrain him so o oh dear khalsa you are rushing to your destruction while i am endeavouring to save you the sikhs replied o oh great king we cannot be in a worse plight outside the city than we are within we shall all die of hunger here and if we sally forth we may escape and kill some of the enemy we cannot remain with thee an instant longer these arguments were recommended for adoption by the guru's mother my son be not obstinate it is best to leave the fort and save thy people the turks and the rajas will give thee solemn oaths of safe conduct and what more can they do now is the time my son thou shalt not again have this opportunity if the enemy come and take the fort by storm what wilt thou do thy sikhs are dying of hunger and they will all soon be dead 
the guru replied o mother dear thou knowest not the turks and the hill rajas i have already shown thee their deceit but yet thou art not satisfied thou desirest to save thy family but how will the enemy allow you all to pass thou thinkest what is good is evil and what is evil is good the guru then turning to the sikhs said my brethren they who desire to go may now renounce me and depart on hearing this the guru's mother was greatly distressed and rose and sat apart to give vent to her grief the sikhs went and sat around her the guru's wives then came forth and joined the sorrowing group the guru's mother wiping away her tears broke silence the guru deemeth it not proper to leave the fort o holy guru nanak dispel my sorrow assist us now and give my son right understanding that he may protect his people i have given him much advice but he heedeth it not even if the sikhs renounce him and depart he telleth them they shall all be killed what he saith is never uttered in vain and of this i have abundant proof yet if we remain in the nanpur the enemy will soon come and put us all to death the sikhs began to reflect we have spent all our lives in the guru's service how can we leave him now it is he who assisteth us both here and hereafter he asketh us to remain with him for five days more what will happen in five days we shall only lose our lives in vain we will certainly go forth it is better to fight and die than to starve we will not formally renounce the guru were we to do so we should incur great obloquy and the seed of sikhism would perish after much reflection and hesitation however the sikhs changed their minds and said it is better for us to break with him and write a document to the effect that he is no more our guru and we are no more his sikhs if we again meet him alive we shall induce him to pardon us the allied armies too hearing that the guru's mother was in favour of evacuating the fort lost no time in their negotiations they called a sayid or reputed descendant of ali the prophet's son-in-law and a brahman both of whom were to swear on behalf of the allied armies solemn oaths of safe conduct for the guru should he evacuate anandpur the likeness of a cow was made in flour a salagram and a knife were placed in front of it and these articles were sent to the guru with a letter to the effect that whoever meditated evil against him should be deemed a cow killer or the worst form of assassin all the hindu chiefs put their seals to this letter the syed took the emperor's letter and the koran on his head and accompanied by several mohammedan officers proceeded to the guru the guru refused to listen to them they then went to mata gujari and repeated their representations they asked her to leave anandpur in which case her son would assuredly follow she was however unable to prevail on him gulab rai and sham singh sham das grandsons of shiraj mal addressed the guru and advised him to obey his mother the guru still proved obdurate upon this his mother prepared to depart with her two youngest grandsons jajjar singh and fatah singh on seeing the guru's mother take her departure the sikhs began to waver in their allegiance to the guru paper pens and ink were produced for those who wished to write letters of renunciation and in the end only forty sikhs decided to remain with their religious chief and share his fortunes the guru told them that they too might desert him they refused and said that if they did so the service they had already performed for him would prove unavailing they would either remain within the fort or force their way out as the guru directed the guru then knew that the seed of his religion would germinate and flourish he kept the deeds of renunciation and also took from the envoys the documents they had brought he then dismissed them and requested to be left alone when the guru found himself alone he set fire to his tents and other inflammable articles what was non-inflammable he buried in the earth he now finally determined to leave anandpur and gave orders to his men that they were all to march at night and during the darkness proceed to the east as far as their strength would allow them when the guru's mother wives and two youngest children had set out the guru went to visit his father's shrine and entrusted it to one gurbak 
Kaksh, a holy udasi telling him that he should never suffer distress as long as he remained its custodian when the guru was ready to depart daya singh and ude singh walked in front of him the second batch of baptized sikhs on his left muhakam singh and sahib singh on his right his sons ajit singh and zorawar singh followed with bows and arrows then came by himat singh carrying ammunition and matchlocks gulab rai sham singh and other friends and relations of the guru accompanied him the rest of the guru's servants and camp followers about five hundred in all brought up the rear End of chapter twenty two section twenty three of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain the life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty three the guru marched by kiratpur and thence to nirmo while at nirmo he gave gulab rai and sham singh a letter to the raja of sir Maur, which contained a request that he would give them a village to abide in from nirmo the guru and his party proceeded to ropar when the allied troops attacked the rear guard under ajit singh ude singh asked and obtained permission to relieve him the enemy surrounded and killed the dauntless ude singh the hero of many a desperate battle the bravest of the guru's brave warriors believing that he was the guru himself the guru sat down on the margin of a stream called sarsa to await the issue of the conflict when ajit singh delayed coming the guru sent jawan singh to fetch him jawan singh was killed in the endeavour before arriving at ropar the guru met his mother and two youngest children and exhorted them to proceed quickly on their journey a sikh who resided in dihli also met the guru on the way and asked if he could perform any service for him the guru said that he might take his family to dihli the sikh said he had a relation in ropar who would keep the guru's family there for the present the guru's mother met a brahman a native of kheri near sarhind and discharged cook of the guru who offered to entertain her party and she decided to take her grandsons with her and accept his shelter and protection her daughters-in-law remained at ropar for the night and next day set out for dihli under the trusty sikh's protection the allied forces continued to harass the guru's retreat he left some of his men at ropar to arrest their progress and went himself with thirty-five chosen sikhs toward chamkaur on the way at a place called baru majara he received information that a fresh contingent of the imperial army was close at hand to capture him in no wise dismayed he continued his journey towards chamkaur on arriving near that town he took refuge in a garden and was joined by five of the sikhs he had left at ropar all the others had been slain the guru sent to a jat agriculturist to ask him for a place of rest the jat tried to put him off with excuses but the guru placed him under arrest for the moment he then took the jat's house and turned it into a miniature fort where he took shelter with his men the allied forces could find no trace of him and were much distressed at his disappearance but the troops marching from dihli discovered the guru's residence and proceeded thither the united forces now concentrated their attack on the guru and were joined by his ancient enemies the rangars and gujars the guru then addressed his men you would not listen to my advice to remain in anampur when you took your departure you did not calculate that this time of peril would ever arrive you trusted to the oaths of mohammedans on the koran and of the hillmen on their gods and cows and this is the result there is no opportunity now of employing the traditional means of dealing with enemies we can only defend ourselves there are hundreds of thousands against us die not the death of jackals but fight bravely as you have hitherto done and avenge the deceit practised by those great sinners 
the more you strive the greater shall be your reward if you fall fighting you shall meet me as martyrs in heaven if you conquer you shall obtain sovereignty and in either case your lot shall be envied by mortals having thus addressed his sikhs the guru appointed eight men to guard each of the four walls of his extemporized fort katha singh and madan singh held the door he himself his two sons daya singh and sant singh the top story alim singh and man singh were appointed sentinels thus was made up the number of forty who accompanied the guru five sikhs went forth to contend with the enemy after fighting with great bravery they were killed then kazan singh dan singh and dayan singh went forth and after killing several of the enemy were killed themselves the brave mahakam singh following the example of his fellows went forth and fell pierced by scores of bullets while the guru was lauding muhakam singh's valour and saying that he should be emancipated himat singh who was one of the first sikhs baptized asked permission to go forth to repel the enemy when he was slain the second batch of five sikhs baptized by the guru went forth and sold their lives dearly ishar singh and deva singh were the next to contend with the mohammedans while these were alive and fought the enemy thought they were endowed with supernatural power daya singh and others prayed the guru to escape by some means and leave them to contend with the enemy if the guru were saved the seed of religion would remain six more of the guru's warriors muhar singh kirat singh anand singh lao singh kisar singh and amalak singh asked permission to go forth and try their strength with the turks the six brave warriors were all killed nahar khan one of the recently arrived imperial officers attempted to scale the little fort but was shot down by the guru gairat khan another officer of the new army then advanced and was also slain by the guru after this none of the mohammedan officers had the courage to attempt the fatal ascent they formed a plan however to rush and seize the guru in this they utterly failed for the guru shot them down in numbers and held at bay the multitudinous mohammedan host the guru's son ajit singh now asked permission to go forth and fight single-handed with the enemy he said he was the guru's sikh and son and it was incumbent on him to fight even under desperate circumstances the guru approved of this proposal ajit singh took with him five heroes namely alam singh jawahir singh dayan singh sukha singh and bir singh ajit singh performed prodigies of valour and mohammedans fell before him as shrubs before the wind his companions all fought bravely and desperately zabardas khan the lahore viceroy was greatly distressed on seeing so many of his men slain and called on his army to at once destroy the handful of sikhs who were causing such havoc in the imperial ranks when the swords of the sikhs were broken and their arrows spent they spitted the enemy with their spears ajit singh broke his spear on a mohammedan the enemy then made a fresh attack and fatally wounded him defenceless as he was he realized however that he had acted as befitted his race he fell and slept the sleep of peace on his gory bed the guru on his death said o god it is thou who sentest him and he hath died fighting for his faith the trust thou gavest hath been restored to thee the five sikhs who accompanied him were also slain zorawar singh the guru's second son on seeing his brother's fate could not restrain himself and asked his father's permission to go forth and fight as ajit singh had done and avenge his death the youth took five more sikhs with him and proceeded to commit havoc among the enemy the chronicler states that zorawar singh made his way through the mohammedan army as a crocodile through a stream the enemy dropped like rain in the month of sawan and badan until zorawar singh and his five companions fell overpowered by numbers his remaining sikh seeing that all hope was at an end again advised the guru to effect his escape he agreed seated near him daya singh dharm singh man singh sangat singh and sant singh who alone remained of the army and proceeded to entrust the guruship to them he said i shall ever be among five sikhs wherever there are five sikhs of mine assembled they shall be priests of all priests 
wherever there is a sinner five sikhs can give him baptism and absolution great is the glory of five sikhs and whatever they do shall not be in vain they who give food and clothing to five sikhs shall obtain from them the fulfilment of their desires saying this the guru circumambulated them three times laid his plume and crest in front of them offered them his arms and cried out shri wa guru ji ka khalsa shri wa guru ji ki fata sant singh and sagat singh offered to remain in the fort while daya singh dharm singh and man singh determined to accompany the guru the guru gave his plume to sant singh clothed him in his armour and seated him in the upper room which he was about to vacate the guru and his three companions escaped during the night he told them if perchance they separated from him they were to go in the direction of a certain star which he indicated when the guru was escaping he bade his men stand firm he said he was going to awaken the enemy so that they might not say he had absconded the turkish sentries were immediately on the alert he discharged two arrows at them the arrows at first struck torches which they held in their hands and then passed through their bodies in the darkness which followed the extinction of the lamps the guru and his companions escaped but did not travel together he proceeded barefooted on his journey and on becoming tired sat down to rest on the margin of a lake in the machiwara forest between ropar and ludhiana sant singh and sangat singh who were left behind in the little fort inflicted great loss on the enemy the mohammedans however succeeded in scaling the building and believed they were going at last to capture the guru whose plume and arrow sant singh wore khwaja mardud gave orders that sant singh and sangat singh should be beheaded and their heads sent to regale the emperor's eyes the mohammedans were much disappointed to subsequently learn that sant singh was not the guru and that the guru had escaped they sent men to the known abodes of all fakirs in the country to search for him but in vain after this the armies dispersed zabardast khan who was wounded in the recent battle retired to his viceroyalty of lahore wazir khan departed for sarhind and khwaja mardud went with the remnant of his army to reinforce the emperor who was still campaigning in the south of india the guru's three sikhs followed the star he had pointed out to them and they all four met at the place now called bir guru in the machuara forest his sikhs found him sleeping with a water-pot for his pillow they awakened him and told him that the mohammedan army would probably be on them by daybreak the guru said he could not save himself as his feet were blistered he told the sikhs that they might seek shelter in a neighbouring garden man singh took the guru on his back and proceeded thither the guru found there a sikh called gulaba who treated him and his faithful attendants with kindness and hospitality gulaba gave the guru shelter in a top story which he had recently built to his house the guru wanted meat the next day and a he goat was provided for him which he killed by shooting gulaba was alarmed lest some of the neighbouring brahmans and sayids might have heard the report of the gun as a matter of fact one brahman did hear it and suspected the presence of the guru in the village he looked and saw the guru on the top story of gulaba's house it turned out however that the brahman was friendly he had previously visited the guru in anandpur and enjoyed his hospitality he now in return put some sweets and a sacrificial thread of the hindus on a plate and sent them as an offering to the guru the offering of the sacrificial thread was a delicate hint to the guru that the brahman would like to lead him back to the ancient religion of india the guru returned the sweets and the thread with a present of five gold muhars from himself gulaba consulted with his brother as to the disposal of the guru they feared for their own safety should it be further known that he was among them to gulaba's house now came two mohammedans ghani khan and nabi khan who had previously known and visited the guru on hearing that the imperial troops were scouring the country in quest of him they determined to go and offer him their humble services the guru requested them to remain with him and they readily consented gulaba and his family spent an anxious night in the early morning he waited on the guru with a present of five gold mahars which he meant as a parting offering he represented the danger he had incurred in entertaining his guest and begged him to take compassion on him 
and arrange for his departure it happened that while the guru was in gulaba's house a sikh woman also came to visit him she had previously seen him and vowed that she would spin and weave cloth for him which she would keep until his arrival in her village the guru had the cloth dyed blue and a robe and sheet made from it in imitation of the dress of a mohammedan pilgrim he then departed from gulaba's village he was borne on a litter which ghani khan and nabi khan lifted in front and man singh and dharm singh in rear while daya singh waved a chari over him they informed all inquirers that they were escorting uch kapir the expression uch kapir meant either high priest as a general religious title or priest of uch a well-known mohammedan city in the southern part of the punjab the guru and his carriers on arriving at lal in the patiala state accidentally came on a detachment of the imperial army which had been searching for him the general suspected that the pilgrim was no other than the guru and determined to make trial of him by what he ate a sumptuous dinner was prepared for the party the guru told his sikhs that they might eat what the mussulman cooks had prepared and they did so after touching the food with their swords a friendly sayyid from nurpur near machiwara who was at the time an officer in the detachment stated that the guru was really uch kapir upon this the general gave an order for the guru's immediate release End of chapter twenty three